It's Wednesday, May 25th. From inside the WTOP newsroom, this is the DMV Download, presented by Steamfitters Local 602. Learn how Steamfitters can benefit your business at steamfitters-602.org. Here are the stories we're working on today. Hours after a gunman opened fire on a fourth grade classroom in Uvalde, Texas, we learned there was a threat against an elementary school in our region. Where that investigation stands and WTOP's Nick Ionelli tells us how school districts across our area are increasing security. Families, students who are at school may see a patrol car. They may see that extra presence. And WTOP's John Doman tells us how a local psychiatrist suggests approaching a conversation about the Texas shooting with your kids, no matter their age. Start just letting them ask the questions they have, but then don't be afraid to ask them how their friends are thinking about it. Finally, we speak with the deputy director of Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Prevention on the question we all have after this tragedy, what's next and what can be done? There are solutions that exist right now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Luke Garrett. And I'm Megan Cloherty. This morning, as students walked into school across our area, they likely noticed a few new faces as school districts increased security around school buildings in the wake of the mass shooting in Uvalde, Texas. One school in particular has more protection today in Charles County, where the sheriff's office says it arrested a man who made threats of mass violence against a business and an elementary school in Marbury, Maryland. Megan has been talking to a source about the investigation. So, Megan, tell us about how law enforcement learned about this in the first place. Yeah, I spoke with Diane Richardson at the Charles County Sheriff's Department, and she told us essentially that they tracked down a man named Earl Benjamin Washington in St. Mary's County today and arrested him for making threats of mass violence Mm. against a business and against Gail Bailey Elementary School in Marbury. Um, Apparently, they believe it might be domestically related as he has connections to both the business and the school. But the school is in Charles County. So then it falls under their jurisdiction. So they caught up with this guy. They arrested him. But this happened just a couple hours before we learned about the Texas shooting. Right. Um, So they were already planning from the sheriff's department's perspective to increase security around this elementary school today. Mm. And then we learned about the incident in Texas and it changed the plan. They had to you know, bulk up security at all schools. Right. And I'm sure it's extremely chilling for parents in Charles County. So how are they bulking up security at Charles County schools? Yeah, we were talking about um, the school resource officers. And in Charles County, they still have those in place at middle schools and at high schools. But for elementary schools, we spoke with Superintendent Maria Navarro, and she explained that they have 22 elementary schools. And essentially, there's additional security at the elementary schools as well as the SROs at Mm. the uh, middle and high schools. So this is usually a time where we're celebrating so many great accomplishments of our staff and our students, especially we have graduations, we have celebrations after graduations. I spoke to the sheriff, just making sure we have adequate coverage given the context of today. And we should say, too, I mean, this is pretty common in our region, but they have upgraded their entryways so that at every school front door, they're locked if schools, if, if the kids are there. So there's a video monitored locked door and you have to, like, go up to the to the video monitor, show your ID and then they can see you inside and then decide if they're going to buzz you in. Mm. So unlike Texas, where we understand he was able to just walk in, the gunman, right. that wouldn't happen um, at Charles County Schools, at least in that way, because they have that security precaution. Our student support offices has been checking in with all of our mental health specialist counselors today. As kids have walked in with questions, parents have contacted the schools with concerns. And so we're here to... Just respond, listen, and be present in schools. Students and parents are going to have a lot of questions, and it's natural to have those questions um, about security and what your school district is doing to Mm. protect kids. Yeah. And in Charles County, I guess the superintendent sent a letter home to parents saying, hey, this is, you know, these are the resources we have available and this is what we're doing. But I imagine that's happening on a district by district level. Yeah. Well, Megan, thank you for your reporting. And we now turn to WTOP's Nick Ionelli, who has been speaking with schools across the area, asking them, you know, what are they doing now in the wake of this Texas school shooting? So, Nick, let's start in D.C. What sort of securities are students seeing today while they enter school? Schools directly in D.C. and all around the region, they've been taking extra precautions today. Now, when we look at the D.C. public school system, we did hear directly from Chancellor Lewis Farabee, who said that there's going to be a layered security approach. And when school officials talk about security in this way, they don't want to give away too much, obviously. What we have is this is going to be a combination 
of school security guards who are not police officers, but they will be working alongside police school resource officers. And those are the sworn police officers. And by the way, as I'm sure many of the listeners know, the school resource officer issue is a politically charged issue that has been in the headlines for weeks and even years in the D.C. public school system. So you see a school shooting like this. Should there be police officers in schools? Should there be armed police officers in schools? That's an ongoing debate. And this will maybe change the tune on that. We don't know yet. But right now, D.C. schools using those officers uh, today. Right. Bringing that issue to the forefront in Maryland. What are schools doing there? Anne Arundel County Public Schools, they say police will have a, an additional presence at schools to, quote, help relieve anxiety of families, students and staff. Uh, in Montgomery County, the school resource officer issue has been a debate. But today, uh, the school resource officers are in the schools, but they are not called school resource officers anymore. They're called community engagement officers as the school resource officer program was pulled from the school system. And then in Frederick County, Maryland, we also heard from the school system there. Uh, it said to support the well-being of students and staff, psychologists will be available at every school in the Frederick County, Maryland public school system for students and staff who may need support at this time. And in Virginia? In Virginia, the Loudoun County public school system says the sheriff's office will have an increased presence at schools over the next several days. We didn't hear about any additional resources being dedicated to the school system in Fairfax County, but uh, the Fairfax County public school system did release a statement. It says, quote, we continually work to make critical safety upgrades to our buildings. Please be assured that we will continue to assess our protocols to ensure the safest learning and working environment possible. And Nick, you also spoke with Sheriff Mike Chapman at the Loudoun County Sheriff's Office. What did he have to say about the specific you know, measures they're putting into place today after this horrific shooting? Well, Luke, you know what I found to be unique about Loudoun County today following that Texas shooting is that Loudoun County Sheriff Mike Chapman was open to talking about it. And he says not only are there school resource officers in every middle and high school throughout the county, but now his office is increasing patrols to make sure that deputies out in the field are making more frequent checks on those schools, on all the schools across the county. Perhaps they're not going to enter every school. They're not going to walk around the hallways necessarily. Mm -hmm. But while they're out doing their job, they're going to be checking up on those schools. So families, students who are at school may see a patrol car. They may see that extra presence. And that's what Sheriff Chapman wants. He wants that extra presence out there. Mm. He said, we're always worried about any kind of a copycat uh, type of incident. Uh, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to show that we have a presence out there and anything that we can do to deter anything that might happen out there. He says they want to leave no stone unturned. That's another thing he told me. So with these extra deputies, the extra security presence, it's a precaution. And another interesting thing in Loudoun County in particular Chapman talked about a safe to talk app. That's what it's called. And it allows kids to anonymously contact the sheriff's office to immediately get a response should there be an emergency happening inside the school. It allows the students to go around the bureaucracy, if you will, that normally would go along with schools or administrators contacting the authorities directly. Nick Ionelli, thank you for your reporting and being with us today. Thank you. And after the break, kids are likely to have questions when it comes to school shootings. We have tips about how to talk to kids about it depending on their age. And we speak with a gun violence prevention expert about successful programs and changing gun laws taking shape in our region. If you want to save money and grow profits on your next commercial heating, cooling, HVAC, or refrigeration project, go with the men and women of Steamfitters Local 602. You can trust the experience of its workforce, members who have expertise in heating, air conditioning, refrigeration, and process piping to deliver work that's on time and on budget. For a partner you can trust who's mutually focused on your bottom line and to schedule, contact Steamfitters Local 602 at steamfitters-602.org. That's steamfitters-602.org. Steamfitters Local 602, changing lives. Thanks for listening to the DMV Download. If you like the podcast, head to our show page, give us a rating, and leave a review. We read all of them and use the suggestions to improve the show that we're so proud of. It also helps other listeners find this, our region's only local daily news podcast. Thanks for making us a part of your day.
Depending on how much news you consume during the course of the day or how plugged in your kids are, they may have questions about the school shooting and how it pertains to their lives. We turn now to WTOP's John Doman, who has some tips for how to approach a conversation like that with kids, no matter how old they are. So, John, you spoke with a psychiatrist, and interestingly, she said to start with sorting out how we feel before talking to our kids. Can you tell us about that? I mean, this is sort of the difficult nature of the conversation. I mean, talking about it the way you and I would talk about this is a lot different than we would when when you talk about it with a kid. And and the emotions Mm -hmm. really ratchet up because then you start thinking about how you would handle it with your own kid and that Mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm Mm-hmm. So coming in prepared and and just kind of having an idea as to where your head is and bouncing ideas off adults because, I mean, this is still fresh in all of our minds as well. So just sort of sorting out your own thoughts and feelings with other adults Mm. will definitely help before you actually sit down and and talk to your own kids about this. And at that point, you have to be a little bit more level-headed and and calm and mature as well. Um, So, so yeah, it's just one of those things about just kind of preparing yourself and, and making sure you have your own ideas sorted out before you sort of sort through your child's ideas. Mm. Right. And we all kind of know how our kids think. Right. But you can get kind of like a out of the blue question that you're not expecting. Um, I imagine Dr. Gloria Reeves, the psychiatrist you spoke with, gave advice for speaking to a five year old is different than, you know, speaking to a 15 year old. Well, I, I mean, to some extent, a five year old, you might still be able to shield from all of this. Um, but then, you know, if they have an older sibling, that, that might be sort of present a different obstacle there. Yeah. But with, with a younger child, they're going to mostly want to just feel that they're safe. You, you talk to them about, you know, if they're not at home, who they can feel safe with at school, you know, mm-hmm. presumably a teacher, a principal, that sort of thing. You just kind of focus on, on the safety and security aspect that they're going to be most worried about. A lot of times children have just really simple questions that they want to ask about. So making sure that we're not giving too much or, or too little information in response. Um, I think it's really important to limit and restrict how much exposure kids have to social media and to news media after these kinds of incidents so they're not overwhelmed by a lot of information and a lot of details. For the older children, for a teenager in their lives, that, that's where it gets more complex. Start just letting them ask the questions that they have. Mm. But then don't be afraid to ask them how their friends are thinking about it, talking about it, handling it, how they feel about it, because that, she said, could sort of open a window into how your own child is feeling. What was most upsetting about hearing about it to them? What are their thoughts about it? How would they want to support a friend who is dealing with a, a, a concern related to this situation? Teenagers are social creatures. I don't have any yet. But um, (laughs) Lord knows when the time comes, mine will definitely be that way. But if you ask them about how their friends are handling it all first, that could be sort of your conduit in getting them to open up in ways that they might hesitate to do if it's just a one-on-one conversation focused on them. Interesting. And what about, you know, our friends, that other population in schools, teachers, how can we be there for them? She she did make it a good point to just ask them how they're doing Um, because, I mean, these these teachers are around our kids almost as much as we are, especially, mm. you know, if if you don't count the nighttime hours when everybody's asleep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're around your kids a lot. And, and they, sh- you know, they're probably feeling like it, you know, I want to feel safe where I go to work. Yeah. You know, they probably have questions, too. So it really is almost just being like a sounding board, it sounds like. It's a sounding board, but th- they have an attachment to your kids. Maybe some more than others if your kid's kind of rotten, but but <laughs> no, but I mean, you, you get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. they're around your kids all day long. There is an attachment there, an affection. You know, I can probably say that they have a love for your kids that most other adults uh, outside of family don't have. Mm-hmm. They're going to be on edge again. And, and I've, I've seen some of them talk about on social media how, you know, they look when they're out at recess. Where can they go to hide? What, what can they do? How do mm-hmm. they evacuate? Just... Those are the kind of thoughts that have to pop in their minds every once in a while. So yeah. this is going to spook them. The the custodial staff, the office staff, everybody inside the school building is also going to have this on their minds for at least a little while. That's good advice, John Doman. Thank you for bringing your reporting to us on the show today. Thank you. There's a question of what now on many people's minds after the shooting of 19 children in their classroom. While there's, of course, a political debate about gun laws, there's also a larger conversation about gun violence prevention. 
Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Prevention and Policy researches these trends, successful prevention efforts, and offers analysis that helps shape local and federal policy. And we have with us now the center's deputy director, Dr. Cassandra Crifasi. And Cass, the 18-year-old shooter in Uvalde, Texas, bought his gun legally online. So we wanted to start with, can you tell us about where the federal laws are around buying firearms online and what the laws are here locally? Yeah, absolutely. So it's actually not possible to buy a gun, a traditionally made gun online and have it shipped directly to you. So what happens is you buy a gun online, it gets shipped to a local licensed dealer who would then uh, proceed with the sale, which was the case in the Texas um, shooting. So he did order it online to be delivered. um, and, And that's the case for every state. The only firearms in quotes that you could buy online and have shipped directly to you are ghost guns or personally made firearms, Mm -hmm. those that are 80 percent complete that you would then build as a kit at home. And so, you know, what sort of legislation has been proposed or passed in D.C., Maryland or Virginia that would, you know, change laws around how you can purchase a firearm? Maryland is one of a handful of states that has what we call a permit to purchase or handgun purchaser licensing. This is a law that requires anyone who wants to buy a handgun and in some states other firearms as well to first apply to state or local law enforcement, undergo a more thorough background check. Law enforcement has more time to check records, check local and state and federal records. Um, And then the purchaser is issued a license and they must show that valid license to anyone that they want to buy a firearm from. Mm -hmm. Um, And this policy is one that is associated with reductions in fatal mass shootings, as well as homicide overall, firearm suicide as well. And we have some new research that is um, suggesting that this can reduce uh, shootings by police as well. I had a question about assault rifles, um, specifically because when we hear about mass shootings, usually that's the weapon of choice. Um, In D.C., there are certain I mean, people talk about how D.C. is so stringent on guns. We know that the majority of the crimes that are committed in the city are using illegal guns. But assault weapons are banned in the district. Where do Virginia and Maryland fall on that issue? So one of the challenges with assault weapons bans is what is an assault weapon? Uh. Um, There are different ways states have approached this, um, even the federal assault weapons ban that we had from 94 to 2004, it took a sort of component approach. So it said, if your rifle has these components or the uh, ability to accept these kinds of accessories, and it had two or more of those things, then it was defined as an assault weapon. Some say one or more. um, And so you can uh, maybe get a, a smaller number of rifles that might fall into that sort of semi-automatic rifle category that could be available. The challenge is guns that are on the AR platform, the Armalite rifle platform, are highly customizable. Mm -hmm. So even if you were to buy a rifle in a state that had standards and, and limits on access to assault weapons, there are lots of aftermarket pieces that can be bought to modify some of these. Um, and so I think for me, one of the most important parts is maybe less about the firearm itself and more about those accessories. What are we uh, doing in terms of magazine capacity, um, how how available those are, different kinds of rifle stocks and pistol grips that can make firearms more maneuverable. I think that can be equally, um, if not more important than actually focusing on the firearm itself because mm. of that aftermarket accessory capacity. Pivoting from laws to prevention, um, is there any pr- prevention program that stands out to you locally that you think is making a difference? I know Baltimore, uh, D.C. have tried cure violence. D.C. is rolling out its gun violence reduction strategic plan. And obviously, Maryland has, has made strides with ghost guns. But is there something that stands out to you just from your perspective uh, locally that's that's changing things? I appreciate you raising that point because too often we do only focus on the policy side which is important. We need to focus on policies that help us restrict the supply of guns moving into places, but we need to focus on the demand as well. And that's really where these programs, community-based violence prevention programs, community violence intervention, it's called a few different things. That's really where these come into play. So these programs include violence interruption. So people who are credible messengers who can get in, who can intervene when a dispute is cropping up and try to prevent that um, event from happening. 
because there is uh, an important retaliatory and cyclical element to violence. So mm -hmm. if you can intervene and prevent one shooting, you can keep that domino from falling that may have carried forward other uh, shootings. It's also important that there is support for transitional housing, transitional jobs, food, you know, a place to stay. These are also important because we hear from folks who are engaged in violence in places like Baltimore that sometimes they don't know when their next meal is going to come or from where. They don't know where they're going to sleep. And so programs that provide some transitional support to help people meet those basic needs are really important. There are programs that exist that we can learn from um, if we really want to address our uh, our interpersonal violence that's impacting communities across the country. For the last two weeks, you know, we saw the tragic shooting in Buffalo. There was also a shooting at a church in Southern California, and now this in Texas at a school with children. There's a crippling weight that often comes with such a sequence of deadly mass shootings. And there's also a feeling of hopelessness. But as a researcher in this field, do solutions actually exist out there? And should there actually be hope to you know, solve this gun violence issue in our country? You're right. Many of us feel like this is an intractable issue, but there are solutions that exist right now. There are states across the country that have put policies and programs into place that can help us reduce the burden of gun violence. Requiring prospective purchasers to get a license before they buy a firearm has strong public safety benefits. But it's not just about buying firearms. Uh, we also need to think about who's owning them and extreme risk protection order laws that can temporarily separate someone from their firearms during a time of crisis are effective tools to minimize suicide. They've been used in the context of domestic violence as well as mass shootings. These are tools that we have in 19 states and the District of Columbia, Virginia and Maryland have them. Uh, we need to be better implementing these policies when leakage occurs, when someone says, I'm thinking about doing this terrible thing, I'm having these thoughts. You know, Often there is some leakage of, of a plan for something like this. We have this tool where we can intervene. And um, this is particularly true in the case of Buffalo, but also there's some reason to suspect in Texas that there were concerns about what this young man was thinking and feeling in the lead up to this incident. And we also need to think about minimum age requirements. So right now, under federal law, if you buy a firearm from a licensed dealer, you have to be 21 to buy a handgun. You have to be 18 to buy a rifle. Some states have said it's not just about buying, it's about possession. So some states have said, well, if you want to possess a handgun, you also have to be 21. But if you buy it from a private seller in a lot of states, you only have to be 18. Hmm. Um, and sadly, for rifles and shotguns, for these long guns, if you buy from a private seller, there's actually no federal law that says you have to be 18. You can be any age to buy a long gun, a rifle or a shotgun in a private sale. So I think there's a lot of gaps that we can address knowing what we know about the riskiness and sort of a likelihood that an 18 to 20 year old might be involved in violence or engaged in violence. Lifting the minimum age for purchase and possession to 21 is something we need to seriously talk about. Dr. Cassandra Krafasi with Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Prevention and Policy. Thank you for your expertise on this. Thank you so much for having me. And before we go, we have a little challenge here at WTOP that for some somehow I've become the, the captain. The queen. Of the walking <laughs> team. I know it sounds kind of lame, but... Our station is having like this competition against the other stations that are owned by Hubbard Radio, mm -hmm. who owns WTOP. And we have to like basically average more steps a day than any other station. And I have to come up with a creative name. We've been trying, or you've been trying, I've been trying to help. The for WTOP days. Hot Steppers. The top Steppers. We have a lot. So stepping up top. Stepping up I'm trying top. to work in the WTOP, but I'm basically appealing to our listeners to send me ideas. <laughs> yes. Because I don't know what to call it. The Beat the Other Stations walking team. And all you got to do is walk, right? I mean, I'm, I'm excited for it. I'll just... Yeah. We just like hook up whatever like fitness tracker we have and we hopefully, you know, blow them out of the water. Boom. We'll see. Is the walk for anything? No. It's for our health and sanity, which I think we could all use right now. I love actually. it. Yeah. Walking... <laughs> Walking is insanely good for you. Yeah. In like physically, but also mentally. It's just good to clear the mind and clear the brain. See, I like where you're thinking. We yeah. just need to come up with a creative name out of that sentiment. Mm. So 
feel free to hit us up on all social media because I'm genuinely at a loss. <laughs> we need your help. And that'll do it for us today uh, for the DMV Download. We're sponsored by Steamfitters Local 602. Our managing editor is Craig Schwab, and our music is by Real World. Shout out to our intern, Rosie Hughes, today for her help. Leave us a review and rate our show if you get the chance, and follow us on social media where we post content every day from behind the scenes. You can find out more about this podcast and become one of our VIP listeners at dmvdownload.com. The DMV Download is a product of WTOP News. Listen on 103.5 FM in the D.C. area, 107.7 FM in Virginia, 103.9 FM in Frederick, Maryland, online at wtop.com, and on the WTOP News app. Have a great night, everyone.